Greetings, Wilkinson here. Today my guest is Emrys Cooper, and I met him, well, you, most of you know that I was uh, took the position of stage manager for the new Bent Theater, and we had an issue with our Boys in the Band play, and our cowboy character quit a week before we were going to be live, and uh, Emrys came and rescued us. He was like a, not, well, not like a knight in shine, shining armor, but he was... Uh, <laughs> like the guy riding, the cowboy riding up on his white horse, and he's the hero, so he really helped us. He and another guy that came in at the last minute, Kai Brothers, so they really saved the day for us. So anyway, welcome, Emrys. Thank you for having me. I like being called a hero. I'll take it. <laughs> You're a hero. <laughs> and a nice-looking one as well. Thank you. Anyway, I guess you you have so many things going on. I don't really, we talked a few minutes before, as I always do with my guests, but tell a little about your background. Obviously, you have a fabulous accent, so you weren't born in uh, Alabama. <laughs> <laughs> where, where are you from, and what was that all about? So I was born in a small town in Devon in the UK, um, February 14th, 1985. I was a, a Valentine boy. I'm a Valentine, born to love and be loved course i had to become an actor but yeah it was uh i was born in a half converted barn on a very cold day one of the coldest days in 30 years so it was they had to heat the the water up on the stove for when i was born so a bit of a challenge for my mom but yeah it was a a strange happy but kind of lonely upbringing in a in a very small village of less than 500 people and uh, my parents were both artists and had founded a school called the Rudolf Steiner School, which is a Waldorf education, um, very artistic and new age. Couldn't stand the school, got expelled, <laughs> as you do. Um, but yeah. Um, wait, wait, you got expelled from your parents' old school? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I just, <laughs> I, I, I had um, some issues with the teacher. Uh, in this kind of education, you, may, you have one teacher teaching you a lot of the subjects and we clashed and... The teacher didn't like my parents and a kind of way of getting to my parents was through me and and like little things that I did I would get in, you know suspended for whereas other people would just get detention for so right. my parents weren't actually that annoyed when I was expelled um they were very understanding thank god and then I moved to a regular school and never got into trouble uh, from 13 to 16 so I think it was just it was also going to school with hippie parents every day my parents you know people were like laughing and mocking my parents and that that added, added its own challenges. I mean, I already felt like a weirdo, and then I had two strange parents that everyone else made fun of. And then you mentioned earlier, at some point, you felt different yourself. Yeah, I mean, literally from as soon as I got into regular, you know, into school, and I realized I was, I just didn't really fit in, and I couldn't really put my finger on it. I didn't have the words for it, but I knew. And I, I kind of felt like it was wrong. Maybe I was a little more, more girly. I think one of the first times I realized I was different was one of the boys called me girly or and like kind of got a stick and whacked me. And I don't know. It was just, it was just, I couldn't quite understand it. It was just something I knew was a secret inside of me that I hadn't figured out. And gradually I started to realize it was my sexuality. Um, but I don't think I, was, I really realized till I was probably about 10 exactly what it was, but just feeling different you know it's it's hard being a kid in general but the adding the gay thing in a small town a very homophobic kind of town um it was it was quite lonely and and sad quite a lot of the time but luckily i had a an outlet i i was i got into dancing when i was five years old and i had this way to express myself and be free and that kind of boosted my morale because school going to school was just always challenging i always felt like i had to hide and put on an act and make up stories to make people like me. And I always felt just, you know, like I didn't fit in and it was, it was scary at times, you know, and there was violence. So right. that reminds you of Billy Elliot, a movie. <laughs> <laughs> I was the real life Billy Elliot. <laughs> you, were, you were. So at age 10, did you have a word for it? I can't remember the exact moment when I realized I was gay, but I think I heard about, you know, homosexuality and I thought, oh my God, that's me, you know, but I, I suppressed it. I said that, but then I kind of, I was like, I can't be that. I, I don't have, I kind of thought that I could make myself not gay if I believed it strong enough. Um, so yeah. And like, you know, Eddie. I think gay representation on television was like they were the clown or they had AIDS or they had a difficult life, you know, and I think my parents, I overheard conversations in, you know, my parents talking about homosexuality. Like I think a girl at my school came out as gay or as a lesbian and my mom said, oh, how terrible. I hope it's just a phase, you know, so I I would overhear these things that my parents didn't mean to be, you know, they didn't realize 
that I was gay. Right. So they didn't realize those words had a big, they crushed me. You know what I mean? Right. Then I, I just thought being gay was was wrong and just it was just going to be a, a sad, lonely life. That's funny that your parents being in the arts and the lifestyle they led that they would feel that way about gays though. Yeah, and they grew up in a different time. You know, my parents, my dad had me when he was 45 and he grew up and I just think what they were surrounded by and their awareness, they just didn't understand. So I don't necessarily think they were overtly homo uh, homophobic, but they just, that's all they knew. They quickly came around when I finally did come out. But um, How old were you when you did? <laughs> so it's kind of a funny story. So I... Uh, I was kind of forced to come out in a weird way, but it was a good thing. So I, I shot this magazine in the UK called uh, Gay Times. It's like a popular, popular magazine. You know, it's a high end magazine for gays. Um, I'm very proud that I was in it, but it was quite a sexy shoot promoting um, a song that I'd written and recorded as well as a movie that I had coming out. And I didn't come out in the article because at the time my publicist and I think I was like 25, 26, I'd moved to LA anyway. We weren't ready to come out. So at that point, I was still pretending to everyone stupidly that I was still straight. So anyway, even though I'm doing this gay magazine. Anyway, my sister was in the hairdresser and the hairdresser said to my sister, oh my God, your brother looks so hot in gay times. And then so she sends me a picture of me in this magazine and she was like, Emma Starling, have you gone gay? Like, just decided to go gay. <laughs> the new trend is trendy in LA, Emma is gay. Right. So, and, and I was just like, I hadn't really talked about, you know, I had had girlfriends for a long time. I was with a girl for six years, but for, I, for about three years, I'd been just with guys. And I thought now's the time to finally just own it. So I told my sister and then I told my mother and then my sister was very sneaky and she's like very playful. Um, she sent my mother the, um, the magazine, shots from the magazine. And look, taken out of context, it could have looked like more pornographic even right. though it wasn't um right. so my mother my mother's response was really funny she was like emerus darling i don't mind that you're gay i just don't think you should be doing those kind of magazines because you'll attract the wrong kind of men wow so yeah that like i've never spoken it really i never really had the chat with my my dad because I'd, I'd moved to america when i was 24 25 i it just was never really brought up i brought back boyfriends it, so but growing up i thought coming out would be this horrible thing but it was like you know you come out when you're ready and i was finally ready so thanks to gay times wow is your father still around now or he is he's 83 and he's in um devon england yeah he's doing great are your parents still together they are but unfortunately my mother had a very severe stroke late february of 2020 just before covid and unfortunately due to covid she didn't really get the rehab and recovery that she could have so she's now in a nursing home and she unfortunately she's not very verbal and she's lost her mobility so it's very sad Ron, that it, that sounds sad wow yeah. hmm. are you still in touch with your sister yes we are we're, we're close and she's fabulous um where does she live she lives in london she does events and she's also managing an opera singer she's she's the life of the party and now she gets paid to party so she's found the perfect career she's done very well for herself she's um She's been working in you know high end events with the Royal Albert Hall. She's done 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 stuff with the royal family. She's done stuff with palaces, and it's pretty wow. amazing what she's managed to do considering you know a pretty modest upbringing. It looks like you both have done well. We're trying our best. Yeah. So you went into dancing first. Yeah. Then what? So Let's talk about the dancing. What attracted you to dancing? What part of it? I was very hyperactive, so as a kid, I had way too much energy, couldn't really focus on school, couldn't really, I wasn't particularly good at school, I was, just, you know, I had a few learning disabilities, I was, I am dyslexic, I had, I think, undiagnosed, but um, ADHD. I had been diagnosed with ADD, but um, that, was, that didn't happen until I was in my late 20s, but anyway, so I was bouncing off the walls, and my sister had started dancing, and I, I, my mum didn't have a babysitter, so I'd just have to go and sit and watch her, which was really boring, you know, like if you was a kid watching other people have fun, and then I pestered my mum and dad for about six months, and they finally let me join in, I, I joined a, a, a different class, because I was eight years younger than her, and it was like a duck to water, it was like, finally I found something I was good at, and the teachers, you know, I was like the only boy in the class, and they could tell I had drive, and they could see potential, so all of a sudden, it just took over my whole life, I mean, I was dancing five, six days a week, sometimes seven days a week, competing three times a year at different festivals, and I was doing all these competitions, 
doing shows. I started working professionally when I was 12, doing bits of TV. And oh. um, and then, it, you know, from I would say I, I didn't know that I was going to be a dancer until I was about 12 or 13. I didn't I didn't belong or fit in in this small, small town. It was very beautiful. I just didn't have there wasn't any opportunities for what you know, or interest for me there. So I, I kind of saw dancing as a ticket out of there. I was really not performing well at school. I wasn't particularly academic, but I knew that dancing would be my ticket to London. And as soon as I graduated high school at 16, um, in the UK at 16, I got a scholarship luckily to the Central School of Ballet. And then I went to a full-time ballet school, which was really intense. You're dancing from 6.30, 7 in the morning all day, and then you're doing academics at night. And it's very hard on your body, but it was really good discipline. Um, but whilst I was studying ballet, I realized I actually wanted to do more musical theater. So I transferred to a really prestigious uh, performing arts school, kind of like the Fame Academy called Lane Theater Arts. Um, Victoria Beckham went there. Well, wow. me and Victoria Beckham were on the wall of we're on the wall of Lane now. So, um, <laughs> so yeah, I trained there, and then very I was very blessed actually because. It's really hard to get your first job. You know, you finish college and normally have to start, go out into the big, bad, bad world. And I, luckily, the director of Fame the Musical came to our college and I did an audition before we graduated. And I, I, I landed the role. I, I, I got the role of Swing. So I understudied like six of the roles. Um, but I got the tour of Fame. And that was my first foray into show business. And then I toured for a year. And then luckily after that, I booked my first West End uh, musical. I made my West End debut when I think I was 20 or 21 in the Queen musical, We Were Rocky. And that was like a really great moment for me because, you know, that was my dream. You know, I, mem I remember from 10 or 11 years old seeing a musical, uh, a, a tour of, actually the first musical i ever saw a professional show i ever saw was fame the musical and i said oh, wow. i said to my sister that's what i want to do and that was actually what i did literally 10 years after seeing it i was touring with fame so then but then being in the west end as an artist as a dancer singer performer actor whatever you being in the west end is the dream for a lot of people and i got there very young and i don't know if i kind of i didn't quite realize how lucky i was i was one of the youngest in the cast um because it happened very quickly for me a lot of people have to work their way up to right. that but it happened right. for, and i i did take it for granted a little bit but anyway and then i worked as a dancer toured the world i worked with different recording artists did a lot of live tv shows mtv awards all sorts of things it was really it was an amazing time being a dancer, um, a commercial dancer, because you just never know where you're going to be or who you're going to dance for. Or It was just a lot of fun. And I love I love dancers and, and the, the life. I'm glad I did it. It's exhausting and, and you don't really have a normal life. You, you sacrifice a lot. Your body's always in right. pain. But I'm, I'm very proud that I did that. And um, I think being a dancer from five years old gave me kind of a good work ethic and a discipline that I've applied to everything else in my life. So being in different productions and working with different other artists, who was your favorite artist to work with? As far as recording artists or actors? Well, no, just when you were, yeah, were you like a backup dancer on some things or, or what? Um, what were you doing as far as the dance? So when you're a backup dancer, you don't really get close to the recording artists really that okay. well, you, you dance with them, but you, I mean, unless you're touring with them, but I'd say in, when I did Mamma Mia, um, I did Mamma Mia the movie and we worked on that for six months and I got to work, uh, with some amazing people, obviously Mel Mel Meryl Streep, Christian Bransky, um, wow. Shirley Walters, Pierce Brosnan, and we were on a Greek Island. We shot in Skopelos and Skiathos, um, for three months and cause we were on the job for a long time, we got kind of friendly with some of my idols and um it was just that was probably the best experience as a dancer as far as like just it was extraordinary fun you know everyone just had the best time i mean it was just a really good atmosphere on set and i have fun memories of those days it sounds really amazing so what was your next step in your journey well i just knew the shelf life uh for being a dancer wasn't that long and i'd always hoped to get into the acting i just didn't quite know how to do it because unfortunately in the west end i think it's changed now but back then you were either a twirly which is a dancer or you're a west end wendy or um so or the touring tracy but a twirly is a dancer touring tracy or a west end wendy and they kind of put you in a into a box you're and if you're a right. mu if you're a musical theater performer they don't really consider you a real actor they don't think you're a thespian so it was really hard for me to transition from uh, dancing to acting in the UK. You know, a lot of doors slammed in my face and just a lot of no's. So I was like, well, can I swear? And I was like, fuck you guys. I'm going to go to LA and I'm going to make it. 
Right. And uh, I went to LA to try and make it as an actor and, you know, kind of fell on my ass. And like, I thought that I'd get the red carpet treatment and it was the opposite. I had to really, it was very humbling because I went from being consistently employed for like six years, never having to really worry about money, always working, you know, having to turn down work, in fact, um, to literally having nothing and then running out of money and, um, Bouncing around different homes, I wound up living in my car for two weeks. I was, t- I, I, I had a lot of pride. I didn't want to call anyone. I didn't know anyone. I was, I was brand new. I barely, I, yeah, I was, you know, I'd been there for a few months. I didn't want to call people and say, "Can I couch surf?" Right. So I did that for a couple of weeks. Managed to luckily get. Uh, then I found this guy that I lived with in Beverly Hills, who was wonderful. Um, and I didn't even have money the first month. He let me stay there for free, and I ended up paying it back. But I had, I was juggling like five jobs. I was like bartending i was working in a shop a clothing shop i was doing everything and anything i could just to get by and those days were tough you know and I, I but in a way it was really character building and it made me appreciate it makes me appreciate everything i've worked for now and, and got gradually i'd say it took me a good three or four years to figure out you know first i thought la was like knowing the right people going to the right parties and doing all that stuff and i was hanging i, w- I was hanging out with Lindsay lohan and all these situations weren't feeding my acting career weren't even helping me at all really because you know those people have a lot of money and they have careers like i didn't have a career at that time but i thought by by associating with these people i would get somewhere and it didn't work so i kind of had to rethink my plan and my strategy and then i I did a play which was kind of a pivotal turning point in my acting career in LA. I did a play called Entertaining Mr. Sloan, which I played the lead role, got some great reviews, I won some awards, and a lot of film and TV people came to watch. And uh, Mark Cherry, the creator of Desperate Housewives, came to watch. And I think two weeks after I finished the play, I ended up auditioning for Desperate Housewives. I shot a guest star on that show, which was a dream come true. And then from there, I started to kind of like work a little bit more consistently still not still not made, not making enough but i felt like i was making progress and then kind of fell into indie producing and i made uh started getting into i kind of didn't even understand what producing was and i started i i'm, I'm a connector like i can i like connecting people right. and if someone's got a good idea i'll like you know it just happened organically and then i realized it was something i was good at and i enjoy seeing ideas and, and good people come together so so this person has the money this person yeah has the money and he has the idea and then you put them together yeah, so I've been producing for about eight years, and um, I'd say I've learned a lot from the failures than the successes. <laughs> and there's been plenty more failures than su- successes, but um, I don't call them failures, I call them lessons. I've, I've learned a lot of lessons over my course. And it also, the producing's helped me understand the acting thing too, because it's very easy as an actor to take everything very personally. But, you know, there's often so many other reasons why something or someone gets cast that you know we always we always think it's about us when the reality is normally other things in play so then you've gotten into actual acting more when did that happen so i'd say after the play i really started to apply myself more to acting i went i went to the beverly hills playhouse i worked with some great uh howie deutsch who's a really amazing acting coach and there was i was in the professional class with other working actors and i think i really just applied myself i knew i needed to work on my skills and just like master the craft of acting which i'm still doing Um, did you you do any formal training for that the acting i started acting and dancing when i was very young because i was on on stage doing plays as well as dancing so i i wasn't formally trained but when i went to dance school college we would study acting. Even at ballet school, you'd have acting classes because you, when you're doing ballet, you're still acting. You still have to understand how to tell a story. So with, even with that word, you're still acting. And then when I went to the other college, um, we did we did Shakespeare, we did scene study, we did like Chekhov, we did Stanislavski. So I've, I've had lots of different techniques and stuff and I've kind of just le- taken what I needed from each one. But And I'm, I'm still learning new things and I'm, I want to keep growing and pushing myself. But um, I'd say, you know, it's, it's a hard life being an actor, you know, because it's, it's often so unrelenting and, and, and you give so much to not receive. But I'd say, you know, coming from a very small town in Devon and going to Hollywood and actually working on professional TV shows with, you know, A-list actors, I'm pretty, pretty chuffed with some of those things. You know, yeah, would I like to be an A-list movie star making millions and millions of dollars, of course. But I'm also content and happy with exactly where I'm at right now. So stage, film and TV, what's your favorite? Good question, and it's really hard to answer. It's like choosing a child, really. To me, it's like all about the job. Um, I've had amazing experiences in all three. Uh, It really is about the story. I'd say I've done more film and television, but I just did a play that was so electrifying and thrilling to do, Um, and I wanted. I actually would like to do more more stage. Um, Yeah, I can't really choose. You can't. 
All right. Well, we'll look for you on all at all three places then. All right. So um, you've created a bunch of stuff. Let's talk about some of that. So yeah, I um, as I mentioned earlier, I I grew up not excelling at school, being dyslexic. I just I was like the last to learn how to read and write. I mean, it was embarrassing. And I think that I just my brain was just slower. It wasn't because I was stupid. I thought I was stupid. I literally grew up for for many years just thinking I was stupid, and then. Um, that took some time to kind of work through. Um, I had therapy and, and I had these ideas, but I never really believed in myself as a, a potential mind right. to create. And then I was so scared. To, I, I had a burning desire to direct and write, but I was very scared that I'd not be very good at it. But um, I finally, in 2018, just from watching the negative side effects of social media, I, I wanted to make a film kind of exposing the truth behind the lies, the smoke and mirrors of social media. I, I, I had an experience with a friend who um, I invited to an event and they said, oh, I can't hang out with you, Amaris. Your, your life is way too fabulous. You you know, I see all the posts, you're here, there and everywhere. And I was like, you have no fucking idea what my day to day is like. You know what I mean? Like, I'm showing you the highlights. Right. And then I was like, that if, if he's thinking that about me, that means a lot of people thinking you know and, and, and as, you know in 2023 we're now really aware of the dangers of social media but back then i was so it was a result of just me wanting to tell the truth um and as a storyteller you know you want to expose i i felt like i wanted to expose a certain area of life that i could tell that i was close to and there are elements of trophy boy that are personal that i can see myself in the character and there are other kind of things that i had witnessed that i put into the film so i created Trophy Boy, we worked with this really cool writer, Anthony Johnston. I directed it, we shot it, and I honestly thought it was going to be like a bad student movie. I wasn't, I had very low expectations just because it was my first foray into directing and I honestly didn't really know what I was doing. I think being an actor for so many years, I felt like I had good vision. I learned a lot in the edit because when I was filming it, I was acting in a lot of it. So I had a really good team, Ben Murray, um, Michael Christensen, and I had a really you know great team of people that I'd worked with on a couple of other projects. So and then Trophy Boy ended up turning out really well. We we went to the we opened at the Cannes Film Festival. We did about tw- fifteen or twenty film festivals, and then when we released the film, it kind of caught on and went viral. We we had nearly a million views in a, I think a couple of months, and a lot of major press picked it up. And I think it was because it was a com- it was commenting on what a lot of people were witnessing and talking about. And it was salacious and sexy and, and ridiculous. <laughs> I made Trophy Boy as a kind of um, intro into a bigger world, a series where we're in development called Trophy Boys. And the we have a pilot and we've we've had a, a deal somewhere else that unfortunately fell through. Hashtag showbiz. But now we've reimagined where Trophy Boy is in 2023 because a lot has changed since... Um, the short was made and I feel like it's a story that I really want to get out there and I think it will entertain but also kind of you know hopefully be thought thought provoking the area you're trying to get people to think about what what's your point I I just feel like I I haven't seen a show that really represents modern life like Mm -hmm. that I really you know I I, I really enjoyed Queer as Folk but I haven't seen a gay series and I also don't want to necessarily call it a gay series because there's not just going to be gay, but there is going to be, you know, quite a lot of gay uh, leads. I want to show a, a, a do a series kind of like Sex in the City and Entourage that's fun, but also real, gritty, kind of like Lena Dunham did with girls. I, I don't know. I, and I think that's a way to educate and enter- through entertainment and, and laughter. I don't want to be preachy with the show. I just want it to be a, a, a really good representation of fully realized nuanced characters with all the warts and all um you know there, there, there's going to be a character that's not likable but you're going to enjoy to hate there's going to be the the tropes but there's also going to be some strength to it too because i think the gay gay ha, gays haven't been depicted that well on screen i mean it's getting better but i think that's one way to change people's mindsets is through stories and entertainment so i'm i, I want to make something that's really powerful with, whilst being obviously entertaining so in the first one you did, the Trophy Boy, so you were the main character. So in Trophy Boys, is there, are there going to be other characters then? You're going to develop that into other pe- with other people? Yeah, it's a group of friends that are okay. kind of prostitute adjacent, let's say. <laughs> They're social media influencers and who the hell knows what they really do. Right. Um, I, I, I've unfortunately aged out. <laughs> well, maybe fortunately. I don't think I'm going to be in Trophy Boys. I mean, maybe I'll come in as the daddy or as a as an older role. But uh, we were casting younger. Um, the character of James from the short film is actually going to be, you know, probably around 23, 20, 25. I've now graduated to daddyhood. Uh, Trophy well, Boys. Daddyhood is in. Oh yeah, I know. I've, I've been racing it. I'm going to tell a little story here. So the day our cowboy character quit 
And then the day you came in <laughs> and you're, you're standing there and you lift your shirt up and literally time stopped <laughs> because I'm looking at everybody on the stage and they're just like, <laughs> so the 23 year old might be great, but you've got a lot going for you. Oh, thank you. I'll take it. <laughs> I also, I'm, I'm not too, I'm, I also want to do what's best for the project. Right. And I, I feel I still obviously would love to act in Trophy Boys in some capacity, but I have a vision for it that, you know, I'd like it to be younger because I want the, the lead character to kind of be innocent right. and, and, and go on a journey. You know, I want to introduce the audience to what a Trophy Boy is. And I think that the character just needs to be younger. Will you have him be in the same type of situation that you were in, in your character in the in the first movie, um, well, in other words, the social influencer, blah blah blah. Yeah, yeah, he's based in LA now, not New York, and okay. he, he ends up being a sugar baby. He has a, he has a few sugar daddies, and he's going to have all sorts of opportunities to make. But let's, and then we're going to explore OnlyFans. I think this is a whole new world that I haven't seen on TV before. We're going to explore these new things, and we're going to take the stigma and out of, out of. We're not going to shame people through. I, I, this is going to be a very sex positive show it's not going to right. necessarily be gratuitous but this is what young kids are doing and I think that it's exciting to explore these things through a new lens because I think there was so much shame I grew up with so much shame and stigma and couldn't talk about sex I mean like everyone's fucking doing it and and it's quite empowering seeing these I personally I think I'm just a bit too old for the OnlyFans thing but like if I had moved to LA and OnlyFans was a, a, would would have been available then. I would have been right on it, making that money. Um, absolutely, it's a, a, a an interesting thing to explore for the lead character. But there are obviously going to be some side effects and and negative repercussions from these things that will also be kind of interesting to work through on this series. I'm thinking because I've had a lot of uh, sex workers and different people on my podcast over in the last year, and one of the things that comes up is some of them have done. Only fans and that type of thing. But then they try to get into a relationship and the guy, you know, that they're trying to, you know, have as a boyfriend or whatever is not happy about what they're doing online. <laughs> you know, so it really affects the relationship a lot. That's a real shame. Yeah. I mean, as long as they're happy with what they've done, right. like, you know, we've all got a past, whether it's right. only fans or something. I don't like it when people judge your past. Right. Right. And some of the people I've had, they're amazing people. Absolutely. Yeah, absolutely amazing. I've got friends that are doing sex work, they're doing only fans, and there's some very inspiring, interesting actually I think it sometimes makes them more interesting. Like I, I if someone has made a career and done well through that, I'm interested to know because they've obviously got a, you know, a mindset and a, a strength to them. And uh, maybe they, they enjoy it. Some of them do. A lot of them do. So you have another project coming up so that you're involved in historical homos i am very excited to talk about historical homos as um as we all know what's going on in the news and all this horrible propaganda anti-gay and all these anti-lgbtq bills and you showed me something that you found online what what, what was that describe yeah, describe horrified i'm gonna read it to you guys i was horrified to see this post this morning a traffic sign in Orlando, Florida, just displayed a message that says kill all gays on the same day that Ron DeSantis signed a new extreme anti-LGBT bill into law. It was International Day Against Homophobia. Yeah, there's, there you go, Florida. Um, so that made just made me very sad. Um, and my show, our show that I co-created, Historical Homos, we're looking back through history in a no-fucks-given way. Around the world in 100 gays, each week we'll look at a different historical figure and it's fun. It's it's like, how are they having sex? What drugs were they taking? You know, all the important things. <laughs> um, but no, there's a, a Bash, our co-host, is like a scholar with amazing insight and humor. And my husband, Donald, is the other host. And it's really fun because I think a lot of history can get quite stuffy. But this, you learn something, you laugh. And um, more so than ever, I think we need to rewrite history because a lot of history was straight washed has been straight washed and um especially with what's going on right now more so than ever i think it's important to know our history trans has been around forever you know it's not a new thing i think there's all this stuff it's like trans is a human right it's not political you know what i mean and we just have a better vocabulary about it now and um i'm very proud to be you know being closeted for so many years and told to be straight by my manager i mean i grew, I grew up you know hiding and then it's only in the last, I'd say, eight years I've really 
been out and proud and and this show is a real has been a joy to work on and i really hope that it will make some positive change what's coming up that you can talk about you probably have some secret projects but what can you talk about? um well i can talk well so i just a last plug for historical homos it comes out the first episode drops on june 9th we're dropping an episode every week during world pride month it's available on deku amazon prime and youtube and it's available on all streaming pl platforms as a podcast and, um, and by the way we're going to be putting in the show notes all of the links to let people find you perfect so and yeah i mean i have we have a i have a production company called idlewell pictures me and my husband just us and we have some quite exciting projects going on there's a movie where kind of in work in the it, which is in the works is kind of like a house of cards set in dublin with a strong female lead and uh, we have a really great actress attached i can't announce it yet we are hopefully gonna be filming that next year we've got a documentary coming um up again i can't talk about who the it's about a band but we can't talk about it just yet but um as a as an actor i just shot a christmas movie in may in la sweating my ass off in santa clarita <laughs> Uh, it's called A Christmas Frequency, and it will come out this Christmas. It's starring Denise Richards. I have another movie coming out this Halloween called Nosferatu, where I play the lead role uh, alongside Doug Jones. He plays the the vampire, Count Orlock. And then I'm about to start filming the reboot of the cult vampire show, The Lair, playing the lead vampire, Landon Scott. So I'm going to be shooting that throughout June, um, and I'm really looking forward to... Yeah, I've never played a vampire, and it's going to be fun, sexy... Lots of fighting and fucking and flying. Wow. Um, <laughs> yeah. So I've been training and I cut out sugar. It's been very boring. I'm not going to bore the, your listeners with it, but I've been, I cut out sugar and alcohol, which being British, I miss. But, you know, if I'm going to be naked on screen, I'm not going to, I don't want to have any regrets. Are you going to be naked on screen? I, uh, well, I was showing everything but my, my penis. You're going to see my ass quite a lot, I think. Well, that's something to look forward to. <laughs> Who knows? It might slip out. <laughs> wow. <laughs> Before I end this, I always ask my guests, looking back at your life, what are some of the lessons that you've learned? What can you pass on? Some nuggets for my listeners. Always to love yourself more and realize that you're capable of change. I think we we underestimate the the power that we have within us. There were, there were some darker days in my... I've had some darker days, as we all have. But, you know, I didn't at that time think I'd get through it and... You have to trust the universe is working for you, not against you. And even if you're going through something really dark and really challenging and you feel like there's no way out, the heavy feeling, you have to try and in a day like that where you're really suffering, find moments of joy, even if it's 10 seconds, even if it's 20 seconds, just to look at a tree or look at some nature or try and find a moment of joy because those moments will get bigger and bigger and you will get through those darker times. I would say try not to take life too seriously as well. Like have a laugh, have a laugh. Otherwise life laughs at you. You know what I mean? Like I find being playful. If you're, if you're getting into an argument or a stressful situation, try and go back to that playful childlike behavior and you're going to get a better response. So my three tips are be childlike, love yourself no matter what. And change is always possible and embrace it. I mean, I think one thing I've learned is we, we always try to resist change and that resistance isn't good you know what i mean you have to kind of lean into it even if it's uncomfortable good words <laughs> you're a fun i'm guy. writing a book next you know <laughs> yes you <laughs> absolutely should it'll be very it'll be there'll be lots of spelling errors <laughs> All right. i'll edit it for you thank you thank you so much for having me guys and i hope you um enjoyed this interview and um thank you wilkinson for a great time today and i definitely want to have you back absolutely Maybe you're you can talk more about some of the other projects Maybe when the Naked Vampire show comes out. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Bye. Thanks again.